Hi everybody, my name is Peter. Today we're going to be looking at another metal fountain pen. This one's brass. This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Someone sent me a link to this one on, on Instagram saying that it's their favorite everyday carry pen. High praise. So I felt I felt convicted to check it out. Uh, so let's see, I think it was $70, something like that on jetpens.com. It might be cheaper other places. Put a link in the description. Uh, I've tried. I've tried lots of other metal fountain pens, as you can see here. Uh, I mean, they're not all fountain pens. This one, you know, is a a ballpoint pen, uh, you know, this is one of my favorites actually, the CWNT uh, Architects pen, it's felt tip. Listen to this. Oh. Yeah, and then it slides back in. Okay, but we're not gonna look at all of these, but I'm just saying metal pens come in a very wide variety of options. Sometimes they're shiny, sometimes they're rainbow colored, sometimes this one I think was a, Indie graph, this is an indie graph pen where it's supposed to put India ink in it and it has like a little reservoir for water here in the cap. And it's supposed to keep the India ink from uh, making the, the, the tip get clogged up by India ink, which would normally happen. You know, this is just like a, a ruling pen. Uh, oh, this one is not a pen at all. It's a, it's a black light. Here, get out of here. Um, this one has cool like bolts on it that slide around. A couple of these are actually pencils or lead holders. Uh, here's a here's a copper one from Y Studio. I remember liking this one. I don't think you're supposed to unscrew it. Pretty cool. So there's there's a lot of options out there. Of course one of my favorites, the Muji aluminum fountain pen. Some of them are very expensive. There's a wide variety here, like uh, the Muji aluminum one, probably like 10 to $15. Uh, here's the big one I reviewed not too long ago. There's some just like Office Depot that you can find. You know, some of these are like titanium ballpoint pens. They're like collector's editions. This one I think was like $300, but someone, I think someone gave this to me or I might've bought it. I don't remember. <laughs> it's probably a bad sign as far as, you know, got the, um, got the Fisher space pen. So there's, I'm just, I'm just trying to show you that there, are, there's a, oh, this is the Kawiko. I'm actually noticing that I'm missing some. I think I have other Kawiko metal, like the metal, I think I have an aluminum, aluminum Kawiko sport. All right, forget all these. This is the one we've got to look at. All right, let's do a quick little pen test before we look at it more closely. But if you have some art or photographs or images of products you're trying to sell, Squarespace is a great way to set up a quick portfolio or gallery where you have total control over how your images and art are presented. For example, on, on, on Instagram, there's only one way that those images are ever gonna be presented. And that little you know grid, three images wide, in a square uh, with the same spacing, but on Squarespace, you can adjust all those little things and have total control over them. You can drag and drop modules around, but you don't have to be an expert web designer either. It's all very uh, easy and approachable and just fun to mess with until you get it looking just how you want. So go check it out, squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Peter Draws. Traveler's Company Brass Fountain Pen from Japan. This is a fountain pen that can be stored compactly. F-type, fine pen, black ink. The appearance of brass brings you back old memories and fascinates you deeply. Long time use changes the material quality, turning it into a precious tool. I think that means like as you use it, like, your, your the oils of your skin and stuff and the air will cause the brass to like form a patina. I do like the minimal type of like the aesthetic of like these Japanese packagings. 
tip, the typically, you know, that unfolds. More instructions in Japanese and English. Cool little illustrations showing how to open it and change the ink cartridge. Okay, it feels pretty good right off the bat. It says Traveler's Company, made in Japan, etched here on the side and on the nib. Also, I guess you could put this part, like a string on this part if you wanted to. The weird thing I've always thought about like strings on things like pens is they're usually on some part of the pen that uh, can come apart and like, I guess if you don't want the clip, you can take it off, but you can, there's a nice little rubber gasket in there. Let's put the um, ink cartridge in there while we've, while we're taking it apart. So far, all these parts are nice and metal. There's a little plastic piece here where the nib fits in. On the packaging, it said this ink cartridge is blue black. I'm hoping it's more black than blue, just out of personal, personal preference. All right, I hope it, I pushed it in far enough. Screw this back on. I guess if you had very, very tiny little hands, you could just write with it like this but I think you're supposed to do that number. And I think I will take the little uh, clip off, mostly because it's like a different color and I like the uniformity of it without any extremities. Okay. What do you think? It has a nice weight to it, not too heavy. Smells like metal, oh, my, that metallic scent to it. Let's try to get a little patina going. My hands are a little bit, a little bit sweaty, just enough maybe to get a little reaction going. Let's see if the ink is going. Oh yeah, there it is. Oh, that's actually pretty nice ink. It said blue black, but it does look, it looks pretty black. It feels nice. Uh, hello, it's kind of hello. Hello world. When I draw fast lines, the ink looks a little thinner, but that's to be, that's to be expected, I think. But at this speed, the ink looks really nice actually, and it feels good. It's actually much better than I expected. I was just, look, I was trying to keep a reasonable level of expectations. Okay, I was just trying to temper, temper the expectations. This, this little action right here with the pen coming on and off the, the back feels nice and snug. And as you turn it around, it pops on there. I could see how this would be a nice everyday carry pen, just, you know, the way it could fit in your pocket. Perfectly balanced, as all things should be. Here's one. Just killed a fly. Uh, okay, let's draw because uh, I want to really bad. All right. Paper. Perfect. Let's hope. Let's hope the ink and the paper work well together. Not too much smudging. All right. As far as this pen goes, I think. I'm not sure if I have any other thoughts. It already has started to develop a kind of cool patina. Like I think part of the surface of the like brass plating chipped away in one tiny spot. I don't know how this happened, but at first I was a little dismayed, but it also kind of provided like a little entry point for more, like a, a quicker development of a patina. So it looks kind of cooler and just in all other areas of the surface of the brass pen, it's starting to, starting the patina is starting to develop just in the process of me drawing with the pen for like four or five hours or however long, however long it took me to uh, 
draw this picture. Also, in other news, I've been, somehow I found myself on this one Wikipedia page about, this is totally unrelated, okay, but I've just been thinking about it because it's so crazy about this, uh, it's called a contamination incident uh, of radioactive material. And, and it makes me wonder, you know, because sometimes you're like, uh, look, I like being comfortable in my own home. But this is a story about how people's houses were being built with radioactive rebar. And they had tables made out of radioactive material and they didn't know about it for years. Basically, this is why I gathered happened. Let me try to sum it up because it's a kind of long Wikipedia article. It's called the, um, the, the Juarez City Cobalt 60 Contamination Incident. What happened was there was a radio radiation therapy unit basically these are used for curing cancer i think or at least treating cancer uh and some some private medical some, some like hospital or something purchased one and then it just sat around for years because they didn't have people to run it so then they uh they sold it to a scrapyard or something the guy who the guy who took it to the scrapyard took it in his truck and as he was trying to take the the cobalt, there's like a there's like a, a cylinder in the radiation unit, a, a cylinder in there with these cobalt apparently sixty thousand no six thousand cobalt sixty pellets in there. And so he was like trying to drill into the machine to take this cylinder of uh, radioactive material out of there, and it uh some of the pellets fell out and got into the bed of his truck and his truck stopped working. So the first place the radio radioactive material spread was just in the bed of his truck, which stopped working. And so there was just like radioactive material sitting outside his house, making him and his neighbors sick or something. But anyway, so then a lot of, most of the radioactive, mater radioactive material ended up at this scrapyard. No one was paying attention and it got spread throughout the whole scrapyard, all these cobalt pellets by the electromagnets that the big cranes at the scrapyards use to move metal around. The cobalt pellets were just getting spread everywhere, just kind of filtered through all this different metal and stuff, right? Just kind of sprinkled throughout, like seasoning for the metal. And then, uh, that was in like 1977. And then seven years later, uh, Apparently, it wasn't until seven years later that there was a truck hauling rebar around. A truck uh, went, it somehow got lost, and it, and it went through uh, the wrong area at the Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico. And in that national laboratory, it went through the, what's called the Los Alamos Mason Physics Facility, which is one of the world's most powerful linear accelerators. I don't know what that is, but it sounds very high tech. And I'm really surprised you could actually uh, accidentally go through a place like that. If you're just a random truck hauling rebar. I don't know if this guy, whoever was driving this truck was like, maybe I should just drive through these um, radiation, you know, radioactivity detectors. Just, you know, maybe I don't <laughs> Who knows how long it would have taken for them to find this radioactive, figure out that this rebar was radioactive if this guy had never driven his truck by these, <laughs> by these random radioactive detectors or whatever they're called. Anyways, so then they started figuring out where the, you know, why the alarms went off when this random truck went by. And it turned out that all of the little pellets of uh, cobalt 60 had worked its way into six over 6,000 tons of rebar and 30,000 table bases. So then all these government facilities in the United States and Mexico, mostly Southern United States had to undergo this huge recovery, decamin de decontamination and cleanup effort to try to find out where all these, all this rebar went what it went into making and where all these table bases went, it turns out they found all 30,000 
contaminated table bases. Uh, hopefully there weren't too many people eating dinner around these things. Uh, according, to this, according to this Wikipedia article, it says only 2,360 tons of unused rebar were recovered, and they visited 17,000 buildings suspected to be built with the contaminated rebar and determined that 800 structures would meet, need to be demolished due to unacceptable levels of radiation. I mean, that just sounds like such a big, annoying project to have to do just because s some guy dumped a, you know, tried to scrap this ra radiation therapy machine and dumped a bunch of these pellets so carelessly into a scrapyard. And then they just took all this stuff and dumped it in a giant hole out of the Mexican desert. And even that bothered a lot of people because they're like, everyone's complaining that it wasn't, you know, stored perfectly. And yeah, it just keeps, it's one of those things that keeps going. But the half-life of Cobalt 60 is only like five or six years. So people, people aren't that worried about it anymore, thankfully. Also, it seems like the people who suffered the most uh, harsh radiation were the people that lived right next to the guy who spilled the a bunch of pellets right in his truck and the people who like lived in buildings with the contaminated rebar re the people who lived in buildings with the contaminated rebar only had slight little uh, gradual doses the, the last sentence of this wikipedia article says chronic doses received over a longer period of time are less damaging than acute doses but i tried to res <laughs> there's any any wikipedia article about radiation and stuff like that has a lot of links that get very complicated very fast. Like if you start clicking on something that says like, uh, Rontgen's, Rontgen, how do you say it? Sieverts, you know, then you start click, clicking on things that says like ionizing radiation or dosimetry or, or the gray, there's a unit called a gray, which is kind of ominous sounding. Like it's so, I don't know, it just sounds scary. A gray is a unit of ionizing radiation. Anyways, I don't know. I don't know why I want to talk about that. That's just, I've just had that Wikipedia tab open for like two weeks and every now and then I'm like, oh, what is that? And I click on it. I'm like, wow, that's so crazy that they made 6,000 tons of contaminated rebar and built all these houses and then they had to go back and knock all the houses down again. Okay, bye.